Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 12 of Life, Love, God, the story of a soul traveler, which is the autobiography of Brother Norman Paulson, who was a direct disciple of Paramahansa Yogananda. And today we're going to explore some of the ideas coming out of chapter 14, the monastery. So where we left off was that Norman had gone on Sunday to see Yogananda speak at the Hollywood Temple. And he'd been invited by Yogananda to come to Mount Washington to begin a new monastic life with Yogananda. So on that Monday morning, the day after, in May of 1947, Norm walked through those front iron gates at Mount Washington once again, but this time to start a new life. So he was carrying his sea bag and he told a sister at the lobby of the main building that Master Yogananda has invited me to live here as a resident disciple. So Norm was immediately introduced to Brother Bernard or Reverend Bernard to show him around, to acquaint Norm with the rules, to get him settled with uh, work and uh, give him a place to sleep. So I want to introduce a few of these people because they came in and out of um, Brother Norm's life. Besides Norm's autobiography, uh, Donald Walters or Swami Kriyananda had written his own uh, autobiography and he described his first recollections and opinions of the people that he met at Mount Washington. So Kriyananda said, my greatest help at this time, apart from Master himself, was Reverend Bernard. Bernard was the alternate minister at our Hollywood church. He had a brilliant and clear understanding of the teachings. It's well known that Bernard had a, a frail body, but as long as he worked uh, while living with Yogananda at Mount Washington, uh, he thrived. Uh, despite the fact that he had only one lung and that he had a double curvature of the spine. So after leaving Self-Realization Fellowship some years later, Bernard moved to Hawaii and later to Sunburst where he spent most of his final four to five years. And in the pictures uh, to the right, you see a picture below of uh, Brother Norm standing in the middle and uh, to his left is Swami Kriyananda and to his right is Brother Bernard. Another person that Norm was introduced to on his first day there was Daniel Boone. And so Brother Bernard had taken Norm to the print shop where Daniel was working. And Norm wrote about this experience. He said, from that day forward, Boone and I have never ceased to be spiritual brothers. Master once told us, you too will be lifelong friends. And we know that Daniel left uh, Mount Washington uh, before Norm did. Um, uh, to to seek after uh, uh, other ad other adventures, I guess would be the best way to word it. Um, one of the monks, and this is Kriyananda's description of Daniel Boone, one of the monks, a young man with an improbable name of Daniel Boone, was friendly, loquacious, and willing to share with me not only the teachings he had received from Master, but anything else he might have stumbled upon during years of metaphysical reading. In fact, he suffered from what Master described as metaphysical indigestion. So you see to the right a picture of Daniel Boone um, and uh, that uh, mobile home area that he's living at there is just uh, a few hundred feet from the Integratron and uh, not far from Giant Rock, uh, which is where Daniel Boone spent um, literally about 40 years in the desert there. This was uh, uh, from a documentary called Calling All Earthlings. It was about George Van Tassel, Daniel's father-in-law. And um, Daniel was interviewed in 2000, probably 2014 or 13, and then passed away in 2015. So this is probably one of his last interviews. Um, and you see below a picture of Daniel and Norm standing in front of Giant Rock uh, playing horseshoes. 
So another one of those monks that was important in these early days was Jean Haupt. Um, Norm, Norm talked about Jean. He said, Jean and I worked together on various occasions. Jean had this idea that minutes spent in meditation were like putting gold coins into a bank. He would literally meditate at least five or six hours a day and more if he could squeeze it in. Kriyananda said this about Jean Haupt. He said, Another aide to me in those days was an older man named Jean Haupt. Jean, true to his Germanic heritage, had extraordinary willpower. He was determined to find God in the shortest time possible. Whenever he wasn't working, he meditated. In fact, one weekend his meditation lasted 40 hours without a break. It seemed more like 40 minutes, he told me with a quiet smile. Yogananda's opinion about this was, it's not the amount of kriyas you perform that counts. What really counts is how much you love God. And this was what Yogananda told Jean in response to a question. I believe that uh, Jean not finding the experiences and the, the progress that he expected to make on the spiritual path through meditation left Mount Washington and SRF in 1952. But here's a picture to the right. I love this picture because it's most of all the mon monastics that were with Yogananda when Norm arrived. And you see Norm on the left in the back. You see Brother Bernard in the center in the back. Daniel Boone on the far left kneeling. And then in the middle kneeling is Donald Walters, who we now know as Kriyananda. And then Brother Bernard is, is in the center, as I pointed out. And Jean Haupt one of the older monks is standing there in the back row also. So what were they doing here? Well, the disciples were actually had just finished building a new foundation for the India house. And uh, the disciples were moving the India house onto its new foundation. So the India house is the restaurant that's out in front of the Hollywood temple. So this, this was a big deal and it took all the manpower to do that. So later in that first week, the first two weeks, Boone had stepped out into the driveway in front of the hotel and he said, Norm, you see those windows on the east end of the, excuse me, on the end of the east wing, third floor? Those are master's windows, but he's in Encinitas right now. So Yogananda had that Sunday preached in the Hollywood temple and then he had gone to Encinitas to handle some problems there. So in 1937, Yogananda began to envision World Brotherhood colonies. And in 1947, he attempted to develop a World Brotherhood colony at the property in Encinitas. And in that colony, they invited married couples and families to live with the renunciants or monks and nuns. And apparently there had been some problems and so at the time Norm arrived at Mount Washington, Yogananda had been in Encinitas clearing up the problems in the colony. Yogananda had once said in a talk about these colonies that the day will come when this colony idea will spread through the world like wildfly, excuse me, wildfire. Yogananda realized though that the time was not right for these World Brotherhood colonies and he put his emphasis on the monastic order. However, several of Yogananda's direct disciples were successful years later with this idea. When the time was right, in 1968, Donald Walters, who we now know as Swami Kriyananda, started the Ananda World Brotherhood Colonies in Nevada City, California. In 1969, Norman Paulson started Sunburst Sanctuary in Santa Barbara, California. And in 1970, J. Oliver Black founded Song of the Morning in Northern Michigan. In 2000, Polestar Gardens was started by two ex-Ananda members on the island of Hawaii. And uh, currently, right now, Polestar is opening Polestar Village in Fort Collins, Colorado later this year. So Norm's first job at Mount Washington, he was assigned by Brother Bernard to begin the restoration of the old cable car building. So to understand what this was, they had built a luxury hotel in 1909. It was built by the architects who built 
Brahmins Chinese Theater on Hollywood Boulevard. And it was an instant hit. So from 1910 to about 1919, it was full of actors and actresses and famous people. But as many actors and actresses moved closer to Hollywood, um, the hotel started to fall on some hard times. Uh, not to mention the, uh, one of the hardest times may have been the fact that um, uh, World War I was just ending and uh, so many people were involved in, in what was happening in the rest of the world. When they built the hotel, the back hill that goes down to Highland Park to Avenue 43 has a 43% grade on it. So that's not something you want to drive a truck up and down. It's not something you want to drive a car up and down. It's just too steep. And so what they had built there were cable cars. So in 1916, they built the cable, excuse me, in 1909, they built the cable cars and uh, they ran um, all the time until uh, 1919. Um, and the cable car building was behind the hotel at the top of the hill where the cable cars arrived and passengers disembarked and new passengers went back down the hill. So the, it was the basically the train station or the cable car station. And Norm had been tasked by Brother Bernard to help restucco the building and do some other repairs in the building. But Yogananda had purchased this hotel and grounds in 1925. Now think about this. He bought a luxury hotel in downtown Los Angeles, basically, in 1925, five years after he landed here from India. I mean, this is somebody who made things happen very quickly. So, as Norm writes, he said, Bernard had instructed me in an ancient meditation practice that awakens the latent powers of concentration. That's what we call today the Hung Sa technique. This technique used that sensation and the sound of the breath to calm the body and tame the mind, leading to internal focus on God. Bernard also taught me how to listen to the inner sound of Om, which we call the Om technique the blissful comforter that reveals the ultimate truth to the devotee, bringing all things to remembrance. I knew these practices would prepare me for the Kriya Yoga I was, I eagerly wanted to learn. So that, those were Norm's words. And after two weeks away in Encinitas, Yogananda finally returned to Mount Washington and asked for Norm to come up and join him in his quarters. So here's a picture to the right here. You see a, a nice picture of Brother Bernard um, in his younger years, to his, to the left in the photo is Rajasi, or who they used to call Saint Lin, who became the second president of SRF after Yogananda passed. You see Yogananda standing in the forefront, and on the right you see Dr. Lewis, uh, basically his first disciple from Boston. And they were here, they were preparing to eat their Christmas meal at, at uh, Mount Washington. So Norm entered Master's quarters as he was asked to, and Yogananda said to him, Well, well, how are you doing, big boy? Which is something Yogananda always called him, was big boy. Um, a real easy name to call someone when they're nearly seven feet tall. Anyway, Norm said, I've been rebuilding the old cable car house. Yogananda answered, God has told me to meditate with you. Sit down over there. So Norm sat down and Yogananda turned off the light. Did Bernard teach you about the spiritual eye? Norm answered in the affirmative. All right, focus your attention there and repeat silently, Father, Father, reveal thyself to me. And Norm wrote, Suddenly, before my inner vision, a bright patch of gold light appeared. I was seeing light where there was no light before. He went on. I watched as a ring began to form of the brightest gold light. Fiery chunks seemed to materialize before me as if burning. These golden apparitions began to connect with each other, forming a solid gold ring of fire. I say fire, but not like flame, more like live coals glowing outwardly from an intense source within. Here before me in the theater of inner space floated a dazzling gold ring of light. 
My concentration fell upon the center of the ring, which, like a tunnel, extended away from me into an opal blue haze. It was like looking through a window into another entire universe, the color of which resembled the evening sky after sunset at deep purple blue. I was gazing into eternity. Off in the distance, a brilliant white light began to appear, flickering like a distant star seen at night. I suddenly know this light. Memory spoke from deep within. That which you seek is now before you. The light seemed to beckon and draw me towards it. And then suddenly, Master Yogananda turned on the lamp and asked Norm, What did you see? And Norm explained what he saw and described the spiritual eye. And he says, That's very good. Now you must go and meditate alone the same way. You must penetrate that star in the spiritual eye. If you succeed, then you will be with him forever. Yogananda then motioned Norm closer and then reached out and touched Norm's forehead. God loves you very much. You have a big work to do in this life helping others, but you must be careful. Now go and know that I am always with you. I want to talk about a parallel here because I think it's important to point out something that happened in Yogananda's childhood. So Yogananda wrote, My steps were eager as I returned to my Gupar Road home. Seeking the, sec the seclusion of my small attic, I remained in meditation until 10 o'clock. The darkness of the warm Indian night was suddenly lit with a wondrous vision. Haloed in splendor, the Divine Mother stood before me. Her face, tenderly smiling, was beauty itself. She spoke, Always have I loved thee, ever shall I love thee. Yogananda wrote, The celestial tone still ringing in the ear, in the air, she disappeared. And I want to point out that Brother Norm had his experience of seeing the spiritual eye with Yogananda, having practiced only Hung Sa technique and some Om technique. In the case of Yogananda, when he had this vision of Divine Mother, all he had learned at that point was Hung Sa technique. Both would receive Kriya Yoga meditation later. This is a testament to how strong and how powerful forms of meditation can be, including Hung Sa. So as I said before, Swami Kriyananda described the players, the people that he was most associated with at Mount Washington when he first arrived, which was a year after Norman. And this is how he described Norman. And I put this in here because I want to draw a parallel between Norm and between Jean Haupt. So a more reliable, if less erudite, aide was Norman, a veritable giant. Norman had a heart almost as big as his body. It inspired me to see the intensity of his love for God. Not at all interested in the theoretical aspects of the path, he understood everything in terms of devotion. God was to him simply his divine friend. He required no intellectual explanations to clarify his perception of God's love for him or of his for God. He would exclaim with a gentle smile whenever I posed him some philosophical conundrum, I don't know any of those things. I just know that I love God. And then Kriyananda wrote, How I envied him, his childlike devotion. Yogananda said this about devotion. He said, it's an essential ingredient of one's meditation practice. It sparks the initiative to meditate. It sustains our meditation practice. It inspires the depth of our practice and it magnetizes God's response. So one of the things that Gene Haupt may have been missing in his search for God was that he had turned meditation into a physical exercise 
without devotion. And what we learn from both Kriyananda and Yogananda is that devotion is just as important as meditation. In fact, without devotion, meditation is just a physical exercise. So you can order your own copy of Life, Love, God. I'm sure that you've probably done this already. There's a couple of uh, links here, the Sunburst online store and Amazon, where you can order your own copy. I would ask you to please subscribe to our Sunburst Sanctuary YouTube channel if you enjoyed this podcast. And please leave your comments, especially positive ones, on our podcast. And tell your friends about the Sunburst YouTube channel so they too can have this experience. So in preparation for next month, I would ask you to study and read chapter 15, Life with Yogananda.